We're just waiting for a few more folks to join us and then we'll be get underway. Welcome everybody. I'm gonna turn off my email. All right, well, I'd like to begin by just welcoming everybody to Resetting the Stage, a conversation about the past, present, and future of casting practices in Canada. My name is Marlies Schweitzer, and I'm a professor of theater and performance history in York University's Department of Theater. And I will be your co-moderator for this evening's conversation. And my name is Cassandra Henry. I'm a recent graduate from York's Acting Conservatory program. And I will also be co-moderating with Marlies for this second of three panels with professional theater playwrights, directors, and actors from within the Ticoronto community and beyond. In preparing for this event over the last few months, the curatorial team, which includes Jamie Robinson, Mariela Nunez, Dante Jamat, and Zoe Marin, in addition to Cassandra and myself, we've been reflecting on the events and protests of the past year and we've been listening attentively to the calls to address systemic inequities and racism within Canadian theatre. So in bringing together this amazing group of professional artists over two days, we hope to not only acknowledge past harms but also look towards the future of Canadian theatre. How might we imagine resetting the stage? So while our focus is on casting practices, we expect that the conversations will extend into other areas as well. And this event is also an opportunity for theater students to learn how the legacy of harmful casting practices in Canada can provide healthy insights to affect change today and in the future, both within training institutions and in the professional world. Education is at the heart of these discussions and we continue to learn about the land on which we all reside. So our gathering here on Zoom is transmitted from the headquarters of San Jose, California. And we would like to acknowledge that the territory sits on the land of Ohlone and the Muwekma Ohlone people who trace their ancestry through the missions Dolores, Santa Clara and San Jose. In addition, we recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which the campuses of York University stand and on the land which I currently reside upon. We acknowledge that we are but visitors to the area known as Toronto, where we share our stories, which has been which has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the ancestors of the Patoon and Neutral Nations. We also acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. It is our hope that this agreement from the past can help educate us in the present to ensure a true sharing and caring of our stories on this land for the future. Today, in light of devastating and disturbing news coming out of Kamloops, we are highlighting the work of the Indian Residential School Society and Legacy of Hope Foundation. Supports specific to the York Indigenous community are also available through the Center for Indigenous Students Services. We now invite you all to take a brief moment to click on the links that we have provided or save them to view more through thoroughly at a later time. Thank you. Before we begin, please note that due to the nature of today's discussion, some things may be difficult or stressful to hear. And so we ask that you remain open to listening and also mindful of your own comfort level as we gather here in our spaces and your spaces and in the personal spaces of our guests today. Please note that the closed caption button is available at the bottom of your screen. And we're aware that it, is, it has limitations, but um, it is available there and you can click on to gain access. We will have a 20 minute Q&A period at the end of our one hour panel discussion. Um, you can type questions below at any time. So if you come up with a question, 
please feel free to put it into the, the little Q&A section there. And that will be only be seen by us, the moderators, and we will get to as many of the questions as we can before the end. Um, the chat function will, will not be available. So before we get underway, we'd like to acknowledge the financial support from the Department of Theatre and SSHRC Exchange Knowledge Mobilization Grant and the York Research Chair in Theatre and for Performance History. Finally, we'd like to especially thank Mary Pekia Thomas Sayers, who is working wonderfully behind the scenes, and our curatorial team who are working behind the scenes as well. We will reveal to you all for the proverbial curtain call later on. And with that, let's get the second panel started by introducing today's artists. So today's panelists will be discussing how theater artists might embrace more inclusive or diverse practices uh, when it comes to casting. So our first panelist is Nina Liakino. Um, we'll be posting her full bio in the chat, but um, just so, so just as a brief introduction, Nina is an award-winning director, dramaturg, and current artistic director of Factory Theater in Toronto. And so her full bio is there in the chat. Next, we have Kevin Hankard. Kevin is a veteran Canadian actor, best known for his role as Superintendent Joe Donovan on the wildly successful television series, Hudson and Rex, and Detective Art Bell on the hit drama, Orphan Black. His full bio is also in the chat. Third, we have Mario, Marlo Nunez. Marlo is a Chilean Canadian playwright, director, actor, and academic. And she's currently pursuing her PhD in theater and performance studies at York. Full bio also in the chat. And last but certainly not least, we have David Yi. David is a Dora Award winning actor and playwright and the co-founding artistic director of Fujen Theater Company. Again, his full bio is also in the chat. So welcome to everybody. We're so delighted to have you here with us this evening. Um, and our very first question is one that we'll be asking actually all of our panels, um, but we wanted to hear a little bit from each of you. And that question is as follows. I'll read it twice. What challenges have you specifically faced in your practice, whether as an actor, director, producer, or creator, where casting is concerned? So what challenges have you specifically faced in your practice where casting is concerned? And we can go in alphabetical order or we can just go in terms of who's, who's inspired to speak first. I'll jump in. All right, great. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, uh, this is, this is a, uh, a theater school. So we'll start with my theater school days back in the, in the late 1800s. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, for any person of color who's been through theater school, um, uh, I'm not saying anything that's new. When you're, when you're a person of color, for the most part, there's maybe one, two, maybe three of you in a class uh, filled with, with uh, kids that are not of color, with filled with white kids. Let's just, let's just call it what it is. Uh, and uh, from the very beginning, you, you learn that, uh, that you have to, um, it's, it's on you to assimilate in order to make it through the program. And, uh, and I've seen, and I saw the other, it was funny when I got into theater school, there were about six of us that were, 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 were non-white uh, students in that one class, but I was the only one to graduate because um, it's hard to play that game and some people weren't able to. Um, but as far as casting specifically is concerned, um, I remember when it came time for us to do our, our fourth year projects, uh, I, it was when um, Six Degrees of Separation was just really hitting the scene. And I thought this was a great play to do because there isn't but one black person in the play. <laughs> and and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's all, it's an entirely white cast other than that. And the line that came down from the powers that be was, oh, we think Kevin's talented enough. He can play anything. We don't need to do a, a play that's specific for him. Uh, and that sort of, um, you know, although I love my time at theater school, it typified exactly what the situation was. So in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is your voice is muted. And in order to, to, to your stories are muted. And in order to, to get anywhere in the program, in order to, to get through the program, you have to find a way to code switch and to assimilate 
And that comes at a price that sometimes you don't realize until you're in your thirties and you look back and go, Oh, what, like what happened to those, you know, to those, those spry years, what happened to my creativity? Uh, it gets stifled and you learn to stifle it in order to, uh, to get that next gig, you know, and, uh, and that's not what this is about. You know, this is about people being able to spread their wings and being able to uh, to express themselves in ways that people haven't seen before. And that's difficult for people of color because, uh, um, you know, a, a cap is put on you or has been put on you from the very beginning. Thank you. Um, Nina, David, Marilo. I could go next. Um, so similar to Kevin, um, theater school was, was, I was one of three people of color in my class. Um, and, uh, I think at one point I was told that I would only be, uh, good enough to be in political theater. <laughs> and I remember thinking at the time and now also, um, well, political theater is the kind of theater that I really like, but they were not saying it in a good way. They were saying that, uh, you know, Latinos or, you know, my kind of people would only be good for political theater. Uh, and then also once I graduated from theater school, um, I did a lot of film and TV. Um, luck luckily, I did a lot of film and TV, but a, a lot of it was, you know, maids, hookers, uh, drug dealer girlfriends. Uh, and so that kind of made me really angry and I left the film and TV world because I felt like, what was I contributing to, to anything? Uh, and then, um, you know, I've told this story many, many, many times and, you know, I'm sure the people on this panel have heard it, but uh, as the previous panel said, it bears repeating so that we don't forget the things that brought us to this place. Um, so my good friend, Carmen Aguirre wrote a play called The Refugee Hotel. And uh, I was, uh, we did a reading of it as part of Factory Theaters. Um, I can't remember what the Playwright Festival was called, uh, but it was a very important festival because it was one of the first- Cross Currents. Cross Currents. It was one of the first for people of color and playwrights of color to put their work out. And I remember being invited to be part of that reading and there were eight Latinos in the cast uh, of 12. And it was an electric reading. It was the first time that I had connected to a piece of work that was from my culture. It was about Chilean refugees. And um, it was unbelievable. Like the, the, the audience rose to their feet when we finished and it was electric. And it was at that point that the artistic director at the time decided to do the world premiere the following year. So I started a campaign to get cast for that world premiere because I was like, this is, I was born to play this role, right? So, uh, you know, I, I auditioned, I did a very good audition. And then I got a call from the artistic director and he said, uh, I'm doing a closed reading of the people I'm considering for the play. The Refugee Hotel, and I'd like to invite you. I was over the moon. This was like, uh, I had been five years out of theater school. It was my dream come true to play this role, to be called by the artistic director of Factory was huge. So I go into the Factory Theater the next day or whenever it was, and I'm walking up the stairs to the rehearsal hall and Carmen pushes me out as I'm about to walk in. And she's like, you're not gonna believe all of the actors in that room are white except for you. And I was like, but there's eight Chilean refugee characters. Uh, and so, you know, sure enough, I walk in and I was dumbfounded. I was like, it's 2004. How can this be possible? How can this be possible? So I was like angry and wanted to cry and didn't know what to do. And I remember he started the rehearsal by saying, we're gonna do um, um, pronunciations of the words, the Spanish words. And the kicker was that, you know, the role that I had done in the previous reading was this Mapuche warrior. She was very strong. 
he cast me as the mute character in the play. So I didn't even speak. <laughs> I didn't even speak. Um, so halfway through this rehearsal, I kept saying in my head, if I never get hired to work at factory theater, I'm okay with that. I have to speak up. I have to say something. So I interrupted the rehearsal and I said, I'm sorry, but I have to say, how is it possible that a play about Chilean refugees has white actors playing these refugees? And I remember an actor sitting across from me, he said, yeah, but it's about the talent, not about what you look like. And I was like, exactly. If this was a play about a white family, I wouldn't even be in this room. Needless to say, I um, quit acting after, after that event. And I started my own theater company because I was just like, it was too much. That's my story. Thanks, Mary Lou. David or Nina? How do you talk that? And I, <laughs> Nina and I play chicken on Zoom a lot where we just stare at each other and wait for the other person to talk. Um, I don't, yeah, I mean, like, really, there's no, there's no, there's no beating that story. <laughs> um, and I mean, like, I have, like, my, um, my, my experience is, uh, is fairly uh, uh, limited. I mean, when, when I was an actor, when I was in theater school, I had, you know, I had the same sort of experience where the, you know, I was, uh, I was never considered for anything other than, um, uh, than, than what would be uh, considered like background. Um, and it was always, but it was always put very politely. It was always like, oh, you know, you know, he'd be really good at the notary. Um, like that. Is he in the play? I skipped that page. Um, and so it was, uh, and I was, um, yeah, I had been directed off stage um, to just be a voice before. Like it was, um, it was not a, a great experience. And there, and we were never, we were never really dealing with the um, with anyone from a subjectivity that I came from. Right? They were all very white stories, um, all written by by white playwrights who were about about white things and white problems. Um, and um, and I was I was fairly vocal about that, which um, which could explain the rest of my uh, uh, theater school career. Um, and then when, but I'm also mixed race, and so I when I got out of school, I went for an audition for this stupid TV movie um, that I later heard that I that they had actually quite liked me for, um, but they'd already cast my parents, and I didn't look as Chinese as they did. Um, so I was not, I wasn't really uh, allowed to play anything. Um, uh, so I just started writing. And um, yeah, I think one of my, one of my, my, uh, my, my favorite casting things was in a, a show at a, at a Toronto theater, kind of like as, just as we were like starting Fujian, um, they were doing Top Girls and um there was a there's the, you know, the character of uh lady niho and um it was was cast with a, a white woman in like kabuki makeup or whatever and um and there was a there was an audience like this kind of like it, it filtered kind of through our community and people were like what what exactly is going on and um and so there was like a talk back one night and so a bunch of uh asian um, actors went to the talk back and uh, when they asked for questions, they asked the director, why, why would you cast a white woman in that role as, as you know, a historical uh, Japanese figure? And, uh, and the response was, well, in the second act, she has to play a modern woman. Um, and, uh, and that didn't sit well. Um, and then we made Fujian. <laughs> So that's, I can't be, anybody can beat Mary Lowe's story, it gets $25. Yeah, I'm not gonna attempt either. Um, uh, okay, so challenges. Uh, so I feel like, so two things for me. Um, 
part of my job as a director and I, you know, mind you, fuck, I mean, I don't, I don't like subscribe to any like directing 101 textbook, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know my mentors that me that me, has meant a lot to me that has taught me directing. Um, like what I've learned from them is like, you know, part of your job as a director is to make choices. Right. And one of the first choices you got to make, you know, is when a script lands to you, you read it choices like what does this play mean to you right um like not what it means to like whoever's sitting beside you not what it means to some other like to you because like you're going to interpret this piece right it's going to be through your lens through your you know so for me there was it was always like it was always deliberate. It was always going to be political. It was all like every choice that I make as a director, there's of course I have an agenda because I am bringing what my interpretation of the, the piece is on the play, my take on it. And so like, how do I see the world, the imagined world, because plays are, you know, pieces of fiction, the imagined world, and then I make choices like based on with my my creative team based on that we build that world. And then once I know what that world is, then I can also start imagining the kinds of people characters that are imagined in that world right like that that that's to me so I feel like. People don't understand that <laughs> as directors um that 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 choice is there and how you look at you know so the whole thing about there's no political choices there's no like you know you 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 cast for the best but like i'm like that's bull i i don't like you you have you have to or else then what what are you doing what why are you putting why am i watching this on stage so i think it's it's the real like, like the challenge is like you know to really encourage directors to to take the cur take the leap of faith and like put what you think is your thing on stage like that is how I express myself as an artist when I am a director like you see all of that with you know the deep collaborations of my team like all of us that's how we express our artistry and what we think of the world like what you see is on like is there on stage so coupled with that is this lack of freaking imagination I think like the the you know, we are so shackled by chains of realism and naturalism, which of course, you know, when people think, oh, that didn't happen. Well, like the default is white, right? So when we say like, oh, there are no brown people in Shakespeare, like there's no, like, I'm just like, so there we go again, like thinking that the natural world is a white world and that to cast, you know, somebody not white is so extraordinary. It's so great. Like, so, you know, this, this whole idea of like, you know, um, the, the universal, whatever, blah, blah, the myth of that, it, it really is like, well, it's only universal when the likeness is white, when, and then, then your work is good enough, right? So the best actor that's normally cast, it's measured against whiteness. Like who's best when you say like, I cast the best, most talented actor and it just happened to be you like who then, who? but, but who like you, you got to measure it against something. Right. So what is your, so for me, like, you know, question, like, what is your sense of like, how do you measure that? What is your default best? Right. So I, I, so those two things I also when when as an artistic director, um, one of the things that, you know, when I invite a director to come play in our season to look at a script I you know one of the first things I'll say especially if it's a BIPOC director like I please 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 read the script with all of who you are I want you and your identity and your politics I want it all seeped into the script marinate in it and then you tell me what you see and the world that you see in the script like that's one of the first things i tell because often again especially brown directors when they're invited into white institutions is the expectation that i will be like you know directing like all the other white directors is like and that's what i often say when i get invited to direct i'm like you know it you, you understand what you're asking for right <laughs> like often i'll go you sure you got the right nina because 
it's it's we're not I'm not going to do the thing that all the other directors are doing like I have demands I have like I will read this play and you know that I will read it with my eyes and my identity and that has demands are you ready for those are you going to support me or are you going to fucking fight me all the way through right so um so yeah I don't know if I answered the question but yeah no, brilliantly. Thank you. Thank you all for your opening <laughs> opening uh, statements, declarations. Um, I'll turn to Cassandra for, for our next question. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, so our next question, what role and responsibilities do you feel that universities and training institutions have when casting their own productions? And how should universities adapt their approaches to reflect the current realities of the professional world and the kinds of new plays that are being produced? I can read that again if it, because I know it's kind of a long one. Uh, I'm just gonna jump in and I might do like Nina and not really answer the question, but I'm jump just- Jump right in, please. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> I respect Nina's flow, so I'm just gonna. I'm let's gonna... let's all do like Nina and just not pay attention to the question. Not pay attention to I the hate cat. you all. Yeah, yeah. Mario, Lowe, you're the only one I love. This is well, going listen, so well. The camaraderie. Listen, listen, Nina's trying to hijack my answer, but this is really what I want to say here. Like, it's up to universities and theater training institutions to tear down the walls, right? Like, this is where the next generation of artistic directors and actors and 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 you know, a theater practitioners, te technicians, and everybody gets their training, right? Uh, this is where people have to start saying everything we've been doing up until this point, it's been great, but boom, push the, plung push the plunger down and blow it up. Because, um, you know, expecting people to come in and do, uh, you know, to a classical, uh, uh, you know, piece and a, and a, and a modern and a, like that, that whole mentality is the is the stuff that's been shackling people and, and preventing them from telling stories right like let somebody come in and if they want to do a dance if they want to sing a song if they want to tell a you know an, an ancestral story or something like like let people express themselves let people show who they are and that has to start in theater school like you know like i i you know i'm i'm doing quiet in the land in theater school and in, and in high school which is which is great. Like, hey, it's a great piece. But there was never any Lorraine Hansbury. Like, it wasn't until I get out. I, I'm I'm in the professional world. I'm looking for stuff that I'm I'm discovering August Wilson on my own. And it's not just for my benefit. It's for everybody's benefit, right? You're taught that these are the classics, but you're not taught what what else is out there. And it's it's a training institution. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's incumbent upon you to do that to open up everybody's eyes to as much as possible. And guess what? If the rest of the class gravitates to, uh, you know, the Black Bond spiel of William McCrimmon, so be it, right? Like, it is what it is. But, you know, open them up to, to Audrey Zina Mandela. Open them up to, to you know, open up to people who you're not going to, who, it's their job. Like, it's your job. And you're remiss if you don't do that job. So that's, that's my first thing, is that, uh, you, you know, theater schools, you don't have the you, like you got your money, like the kids are there, right? So make a mess, like make a mess, like like do stuff that you're not gonna, you might not get to do in the professional world and, and, and just throw stuff against the wall and let the kids talent really shine through. That's, that, that would be my, my suggestion. But, so, but I, I will say though, Kevin, I'm gonna one up you on that one is that like, yes, make a mess, but be sure that you have the right people to support that mess. Oh, 100%. My problem right right now is that theater schools are not being honest, right? With what they're capable of doing, capable of actually teaching and not doing. And so here they are accepting, you know, and wanting to diversify, but the people who are going to be teaching, who are going to be passing on the knowledge has no clue on how to take care of BIPOC students, none whatsoever. And so maybe, you know, if we're just a little bit honest and a little bit more transparent with ourselves, like if, if you can't handle that, if you can't create safe spaces for everyone across the board and are able to teach the work right, that everybody is craving for, that everybody should be knowing outside of the classical, 
then you got to make room for new people, for, for, for new elders, for new knowledge keepers, for new faculty, right, to come in and do the right jobs, right? Because right now, you know, we're thinking about the students, but my problem is, is with the faculties. And some of it, it's time's up, my friend. And if you are wanting to diversify your student body, you have to diversify your faculty. Because even though, you know, I'll see, you know, some, you know, they're, they're going to teach, you know, Black Canadian works. But if it's taught by some aging old white dude, I'm sorry, I'm out. Because I know that that's not going to be like, there's, there's already a distrust there for me. Um, but also just to be equipped to create safe, creative spaces for, for the kinds of creations that are happening right now in the professional world, we got to put it in into our training institutions. Um, again, to, to de demythicize this whole idea of universality, of like what excellence, of classics, what does that even mean? Right. Um, and I feel like a lot of right now of who, who, who has the power um, are no longer qualified. And I think on that is also the, 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 the definition of what a classic is, the definition of what theater history is, the, the how far we roll back when we, um, when we look at what has defined the theatrical landscape and we, we skim over uh, a lot of the the fairly recent past where a lot of um a lot of progress has been made a lot of um a lot of new people have been telling stories a lot of people are telling stories in in uh in in new ways where the you know if if the 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 theater that you are teaching is only the theater that is um that is of a certain that is of a certain type that is like if you're only doing identity plays if you're only doing um things that are like you know about um uh, about tolerance um then uh then you're you're really doing a disservice to the the students because when they walk out in the world that's not the work that's being done anymore that's not the work that that anybody is um uh is is truly championing like where people are are telling stories in it's, it's not really it's not just a an ethnic diversity but it's a diversity of storytelling and, and um uh and artistic practice that i think that we um the the the, the kids need to start learning about uh yes i i agree with everything that's been said um for me you know a lot of people say uh, you know, in theater school should, you know, a lot of the plays that, you know, cater to larger, larger casts uh, don't have a lot of characters of color in them. And so what do you do with that? Or if it is a large cast with all characters of color, what do you do with your mostly white students? Uh, and so, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this and a lot of people say, well, in theater school, you should, you know, it's the time to experiment and you should be able to do anything and everything and go for it. And to some degree, I agree with that, but I also think, and I really, really strongly believe that we can't deny the identities of these people. We can't erase race. We can't pretend that that person is not black, that that person is not white, that that person is not Latino. You know, we live in a world where we are judged daily. When we walk out that door, we are looked at based on what we, what culture we are, what ethnicity we are. As much as we don't want that to happen, it is what happens. And so when you go into a theater institution and then you say, forget everything, forget that you are a color, just be a human being. Well, we can't. We can't erase the history that has brought us to this place. You know, we talk about, you know, just a few days ago, 215 children's remains were found in a school. How can we forget that history? So when you tell students, we're just gonna, you know, don't worry about race, don't worry about color, just be a human being. Well, first we have to deal with the fact that 215 children were found in a school and we have to deal with slavery and we have to deal with 
you know, the colonization of the Americas. We have to deal with these things. We can't not talk about them when you're in a theater institution. And I think one of the solutions is to do devised work because then you have everybody's voice in that room equal. You don't, ha you don't have a hierarchy of casting of like the main lead character is gonna be this white character. So start writing more, start like training these actors to become creators, not just actors. That's and I'm sorry, can I just say one more thing? Yeah. So I think I think there's something to be said about looking at the current structures right now that are holding our current theater training institutions prison um, to certain choices that they have to make, right? Because often, again, the excuse that I often hear is like, well, we tried to get this so-and-so, you know, to be faculty member, or we encourage the so-and-so to apply to be, you know, so that they can teach, like the excuses of why there's not a lot more BIPOC faculty members or why we can't get more BIPOC directors to, to direct school productions. And yeah, it, it is an obstacle. Um, and look at the obstacles at which, <laughs> you know, why you can't diversify your positions of power. It's all there. Like, and yet, you know, you can't get enough BIPOC people in there. Well, then maybe we should take a look at that structure. You know, maybe, you know, the pressure for a school to put on a season of like two, three plays, maybe we need to, like, do you know what I mean? Like, like right now, our theater companies are examining their own structures, like, multi-leadership, you know, blah, 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 and all of that stuff are happening, you know, in professional theater companies. I just don't understand why they, we can't have kind of a radical restructuring of right now, like what faculty means, why, why, you know, important theater artists like can't be part of like a theater training institution and sacrifice their careers, their practice, where those actually go hand in hand when you're teaching your students. You know, like, I don't know why there's, there, there's a heat, like there needs to be like, should there? Like, I think that I'm a better teacher because I'm a practicing artist. I become less valuable when I have to put everything onto my teaching and I can no longer direct plays. And that's why I'm never gonna be part of a faculty. I cannot, right? But so, but I know that I'm a pretty okay teacher. So where do, how do I, how do I do this? When, when I know that I can do both, but there's no institution that will accommodate my practice, you know? So, and that's gonna be, and that, that's just me. There's gonna be a lot of us that are gonna be in the same position. So maybe take a look at your internal structures right now and how theater institutions are do, theater training institutions are structuring their seasons and who their guest artists are and who their faculty members are and start like accommodating, making accommodations so that you're not left with the people who have the PhDs and the blah, blah, blahs like head of your faculty and they're all like 99% white. Thanks Nina. What, what, what you're suggesting here really also really reminds me of like a, a broader definition of it, to think about casting and you think about, you know, like sculpture and casting and how rigid that can become and how everybody within institutions kind of are fit, kind of have to, 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 to succeed, you must fit into a particular mold that this larger cast has created. And it seems like what's happening now, and we've heard in the previous panel that this is not the first time that these conversations has happened. And I'm sure many of you have already been on these panels before, but it is this moment of rupture, of breaking, of taking these casts and, and shattering them. So. Well, but casting is, is the verb, Marley. It's like, I'm interested in who's doing the casting because that is really the root of the problem here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this might lead, I mean, I, and I guess I really appreciate the, that you're throwing it back at the institutions, that it's not for the artists to solve the, the universities and the training, training schools, that it's, you know, that's, that's also the job of these institutions to be closely examining themselves. Um, I am interested to, to, within your own practices, are there transformations in the last, you know, different things, whether it's writing plays or looking at what you might go to audition for, um, you, 
are there ways in within your own practices that you've shifted, whether that not necessarily in response to, to schools or but um, in response to other transformations within the theater industry, do you approach casting differently today than you did five or 10 years ago? Um, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to think that I've evolved, you know, from the girl that was, you know, angry and, and um, stubborn and uh, angry. <laughs> um, and for a long time in my own theater company, I was quite militant about only casting Latinos to play Latino roles, but that was a political decision. That was because I felt that um, actors within my community just didn't get the opportunities. And so I was like, the only way you get better is if you do it more. So I was very, very militant about that. And a lot of people didn't agree and, and still people don't agree with me. Um, you know, and I, and, I, and I hear when people say like, as a black actor or as a Latino actor, I wanna be able to play Hamlet or, you know, Gertrude, or I wanna do the classics. I want to be able to do that. I have a huge problem with the classics. I, I think that Shakespeare should, there should be a moratorium on Shakespeare um, because we are perpetuating a colonial master to be the master of all writing. And I just don't think that's possible. I don't think it's possible for one man to be the greatest playwright of all time. And so, um, you know, I say to these actors, sure, if that's what you want, go for it. Like you as, as an individual have the power to create your own journey of, as an artist. And so if that's what you wanna do, then you should be able to do that, right? But, I think the I think that um, as I you know as I closed down my company and as I started to do more writing and now that I'm doing my PhD and I'm really looking at these issues uh, from an academic point of view I think we need to really I don't know if I've changed in my militancy you know a lot of people don't agree with me and a lot of people think well that's such a um, uh, essentialist way of looking at casting, you know, that only Latinos can play Latinos, that only Blacks can play Blacks. But I just look at the work of August Wilson, for example, and he was adamant. He was adamant about having his community be represented on stage because for so long, they didn't have that. And we still don't have that. We still don't have that equality. Like somebody in the panel earlier said, the ideal is that we all play everything and anything, and that is the, the goal. Is it though? Is that the goal? I don't think so. I don't want my identity erased. I don't want who I am, who I've become based on what I am, who I am, where I come from, what language I speak, to be erased eventually because this is the reality we live in right now. We live in a world where we judge people by what we look like. We judge, like, am I wrong in saying that? I don't know. I don't know. And I'm, I'm constantly looking at this question. I don't have an answer. I'm sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, the question was just whether or not you approach casting, like from your various positions as artists, um, any differently today than five or 10 years ago. Uh, fortunately, uh, um, you know, acting is a battle of attrition. Right, and I can only speak from that lens. I've never directed. I probably never will direct, uh, <laughs> or maybe I will. Nina may force me to do that. But um, um, so even when I was a, a younger actor trying to break into film and TV, uh, I was never really uh, like big and buff and athletic 
and that kind of thing. And those were the roles when you're in your 20s that they're sort of looking for for a, a black actor, right? A lot of the time, um, which is portraying and, and playing on a whole different kind of trope. Uh, now that I'm, you know, I'm older and 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 you know, grayer and fatter, you know, I'm 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 li- I'm I'm falling into a different kind of category where they're actually looking for chops and 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 things are are working better that way as a result of that. Um, you know, and now there's there's a big uh, people have been forced into this push for diversity, right? Which seems like it's a great time, and and there's a lot of people who are complaining saying I can't get any roles because everything is you know everybody's looking for for black actors and and directors are saying well, I can't get any work because all they're looking for are female directors, and I'm like, well, tough, like wel- welcome to my world, right? Like welcome to the the first you know 20 plus years of my career. Uh, so so things things are changing a little bit that way. Uh, I think we just have to be we have to be uh, aware of what's going on and not fall into uh, into complacency, right? And make sure that the stories that are being told are being told with integrity and not to fill quotas, uh, and that we're not perpetuating stereotypes uh, in in those roles that uh, that are being offered out there because there's 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 still a lot of you know there's still a lot of uh, a pablum being being parsed out there, and and we have to be aware of that. Uh, on the same token, um, you know, representation matters, right? Like seeing seeing your faces on screen matter. Um, a story I tell a lot is when I was a kid, uh, at every family function, every family function we went to, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, in the corner of the room, Cool Runnings would be playing on a VHS tape somewhere and everybody be sitting around laughing at that at the movie and i hated it because i was like you know a, a jamaican guy in a freezer with you know breaking off dreads and an ice cream tr- that, that that upset me back then but my, i i understand because uh we celebrated the fact that our island our culture our people were actually put on a big screen on a in a disney movie like we've made it we've arrived right um but but there's a reason why tyler perry is a, is a billionaire right? He's not doing, um, you know, what one would classify as high art, but he's putting Black people on screen, and he's telling Black stories, and he's not telling them for anybody else. If anybody wants to come take a visit and see what's going on and laugh, you're welcome to, but he's talking to his people, and he's talking on a level that his people understand, and and Black people eat it up because representation matters, so I'm glad to be a, uh, on that train, and I'm glad that there are act, there's actually work out there now, and I'm glad uh, that at this point now I can finally say that I, I refuse to now moving forward that I'm not going to be the black best friend in a white movie. Like I'm not I'm 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 done with that. People will look back at my career and go, "There's a lot of black best friend roles in your resume, bro." But you know, moving forward, that uh, that doesn't have to be what we have to settle for. So. Um, there's still a whole lot of work to be done and there's a whole lot of wolves in sheep's clothing and we have to be aware of that. But um, I- I'm, hoping that the, I'm hoping that the tide is really turning. It seems like it is, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll reserve judgment at this moment. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my casting practices haven't really changed in the past five, 10 years. My casting practices are what they, were five years ago, <laughs> ten years ago. There, I mean, and you know, I'm 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 a I'm a, a playwright. I don't I don't really. That's that's not really my um, my wheelhouse. A lot of the time, um, as an AD, as I'm an AD of an Asian Canadian theater company, I know what those practices are are going to be. Is what we were founded on. Um, I, I I will say on on a Hanchard's point that. Um, you know, where the 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 Asian community, uh, when it when it comes to um, representation, we're still being shown like our version of Cool Runnings and being like, right, pretty cool, huh? Um, and that's something that like we we really have to uh, kind of make a stand against. Is that like it's not all fucking magic swords, for Christ's sake. Um, this is like, and I, and I refuse to, to be, to be happy about like, just because there's something on a major network that is, um, that, that has an, an all Asian cast, if it's shit, it's, it's not a win for anybody. Um, 
and uh, and if it's still playing into trope and playing into stereotype, then it has to like we we need, but it can't just be just the one. Like we can't just be shown the one and being like, huh? So we're cool now, right? Um, it has to like we need a diversity of storytelling. We need a uh, we 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 just we need to fill the books with our names so that um, so that one can't be. <laughs> we can't be forced into that model minority myth anymore. Um, but yeah. Nina? <laughs> I don't know anymore this question. I don't know. Dudes, it comes and goes and I'm tired. Um, <laughs> um, but <sighs> transformative. I'm tired of that word too. Um, listen, like, you know, it comes and goes. Sometimes there are days when it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's working, you know, and I look around, um, you know, our theater scene and even like just on the Bathurst corridor, right? It's like, I'm no longer alone. Like I, I've, I've got Miss Chan on the Theater of Past Mariah. I got Wadey on the East End with Soul Bever. And now I got Mr. Mike Payette at Tarragon. Like, come on. Like, that is like celebration, you know? Um, and then there's some days where it's like, are we like 10 years back again? Like, you just hear horror stories, you you see it on your on your socials, you know, um, that throw us back again as if nothing has changed and nothing, you know, um, it, for me, it's like what I get impatient about is, is the powers that be are just so scared of taking a risk on us. And I'm so tired of like having to have our work be 100% perfect all the freaking time. And yet with white work, it's like, it's okay if you fail. Good effort, A for effort. And, you know, and I've seen a lot of those and it's okay. And they get a pass, you know, but when it comes to like our work, there's just, again, another set of standards or rules or whatever, like another measuring stick of excellence that is just so unattainable, right? Like, uh, and and once you fail it, that's it. Like the AD is done taking a chance on you and they can go, well, we tried, but nobody came. So here we go back to our default all white season, you know? And it's like, dude, like you, it takes time to earn the trust of your audiences. And it, it takes more than having a one badly reviewed Brown show against like 10 badly reviewed Shakespeare's that still keep coming back and getting remounted. Like, come on. It is like, there's just, um, and it still exists, you know? So I, 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 like, and it's up to us that right now the 80s of color, you know, and David knows this very well. Like we do the extra work, right? Of taking the risks on up and coming BIPOC graduates, right? Because nobody else. And then they're, and they're proven, <laughs> I know they're proven their worth. I try to hire them again the next season. It's like, I'm sorry, I got Stratford. And then I don't see them ever again, right? And I'm like, you're welcome, Stratford. You know, like I just, I can't. And, and, and so, you know, and, and that happens every single time. Like we are the stepping stones, at least our factory, like, you know, when I was at Fujin Cahoots is the same, like we're the bridge, we're the stepping stones. And I'm like super duper happy. Like I will never stand in my artist's success. That's great. But that is the reality. Um, because a lot of the dreams hang on to the festival stages, right? To the Shaws and to whatever. But like, they won't take a chance on them, like the people, like un until we do. And once they've proven their worth on our stages, it's like, oh, that's that's the the boot camp that we were. <laughs> that's the big audition. Yeah. But if we but if we hadn't found them, then they would have then then at that same that you know at that that same moment they would be like, we couldn't find anybody. We don't. Yeah. There's nobody out there. It's, it's like, like it's not it's not that they're it's not that they're taking credit for it well they are taking credit for it um it's not it's not that the artists go to those to those places they're welcome to, to to go to those places and to achieve those 
um, those those dreams of um, of their of their white classmates. Um, but they, but if we hadn't if we hadn't built a place for them in the theater for them to for them to cut their teeth, then there would be no festival for them because the festival not because like oh we're so great we did we did these wonderful things for them but because the festival doesn't look and i don't i don't mean to pin this on the fe- like on on the festival it's like it's it's like all really large white institutions they don't they don't look they don't put the work in they don't you know they they rely on the minor leagues and i'm tired i don't want to be known as a minor league so the more that we do this and the more that we let that progression happen the more will be known to minor leagues and yes uh, in the back Mary Lowe. <laughs> um, um i think i think also we have to um hold institutions accountable for pushing all of the students towards the festival towards shakespeare and shaw why are you putting that up on a pedestal as it's as though it's the pinnacle of acting and it's the pinnacle of success. Right there, you're like the theater school systems are churning out white. Uh, like I, I was once on a, I, I watched a panel on um, uh, acting methods, you know, old acting methods and do they, can we still use them now? So uh, Stanislavski. And one woman on that panel said, you know, a white student goes to a theater school to become a theater student, to become a theater practitioner. Students of color go into theater school to become white. And it's because the theater school systems, as much as they say, yeah, we're going to do an indigenous play and we're going to do a black play and we're going to do, you know, whatever play, the foundation of the learning is you need to do Shakespeare, you need to be classically trained, and you need to, uh, and you're learning these like Russian old methods of acting. There's no, there's no new methods to, that, that are being taught. And so when theater school students come to our, our, you know, small little indie companies, they're like, they're looking towards that big thing because that is what success is in this country. And that is the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you, um, Marilo, and and everybody for your um, answers and input. That was um, absolutely amazing to hear everybody's opinions. And that's a great uh, where Marilo left off. Um, segue into our last question before a Q and A. What? is happening or what do you think needs to happen um, in order for new opportunities to open up for racialized or um, BIPOC artists? And what advice might you offer emerging artists as they enter the profession themselves? I mean, I think uh, I think the the first thing that needs to happen is we need to start cultivating more and more work by BIPOC writers and BIPOC creators, um, and not um, and not having that work be a consolation prize or a um, or a band aid for like oh we got a uh, we 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 got a, a, a black kid let's do has anyone heard of August Wilson? Um, it's like the, we have to know August Wilson. And then just have him there for the kid to access when you take them in, right? Like these, we, I mean, I, I think like in, in the professional community, we need to, we, we really need to develop these plays. Um, in the, I think in the academic community, you need to start really making and, and making times and building bridges with artists who can create those uh, those larger works because the other thing it's it's true we don't have we don't have like a in and um you know a thousand like august osage counties um or like we the the work that is for large casts is um is few and far between right um already uh and for 
shows that have um, that have roles that are just as um, delightful for uh, for BIPOC students as they as they are for um, for for non BIPOC students. Uh, there's there's hardly any. We need to develop them. We need to develop those voices. And we need to develop those um, those stories so that uh, and it, it can't be as a response to the the cohort that you currently have running through the halls. It has to be as a contribution to Canadian theater. That's all. All right, Miranda Priestley, that's all. I love it. Um, uh, anybody else like to contribute? Uh, Kevin? Um, like, I think I just, I keep coming, the reason why I haven't, I haven't chimed in is because I think I said it already. Mm -hmm. You know, I really, I really do feel like the onus is on those theater schools and what, and, 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 you know, I just, I just hope that what I said, when I said for the theater schools to make a mess and, and for everybody to play, that's not, I didn't mean for everybody to play everything. I mean, I want them to just tear down the structure, tear down the structure that, that has made them what they are. It's built upon that. Because when I came out of theater school, all I wanted to do was work at Stratford for the next 40 years and call it a career, Right until that place broke my heart. That's a whole nother story, right? But that's that but you realize that you, you know, you, there's anyway, like that. So I just need I need I need theater schools to just tear it down and 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 allow people, allow the richness of the tapestry to really uh play itself out in its fullness, right? And right now it's it theater school is meant to go like this and just put you into the funnel. And I just want that blown up. And uh, I think I think it's I think it's the beginning. Uh, when you throw a bunch of of you know we don't want to put the onus on the artists. It has to be the institutions. But when you got a whole bunch of actors coming out of theater school who are who are ready to do non traditional work um, and don't fit in the boxes, you know a whole bunch of to be youngs out there in the streets is what we need right? Like that's what we need. People who cannot be contained and can't be controlled and, and just have stories to tell and are going to tell them come hell or high water. Uh, I think that that's what we need to be churning out in order to, in order to really start to turn the tide. I mean, I will say that the, when, um, when we have that, that, that showcase thing and there's like all the, the graduating students kind of like come to a single place and there's like, there's, there's panels afterwards and they get to ask, you know, artistic directors and, and industry professionals things that what I hear a lot of is these um, kids of color coming out saying like, I don't want to be pigeonholed as just an Asian actor or just a black actor. And I'm like, who broke you? And the institutions did. Yeah. Like, you, like that should not be the thing that they're coming out of school being afraid of. What a ridiculous thing to be afraid of. I totally, um, agree. totally agree. And I, I don't like, and they're, but they're taught that they're taught that within the institution that they're come out of. And, um, and it's, it's heartbreaking every time. Yeah, completely. You know, I, I, uh, I also went to school to learn how to write plays and, um, and when I, uh, when I was writing those plays, I just couldn't wrap my head around how to write those plays because they were structured in such a way that is also very Eurocentric. And so I have taught myself how to teach the Fornes method, how to teach a new way of writing theater that is not Eurocentric, that is not colonial. And, and, and it's because I think there are different ways of doing theater. You know, a Fornes play doesn't make sense. It goes in a circle. A character appears and then never appears again. And so what? So what? And so I've really, really immersed myself in bringing this method to Canada so that we can start training the next generation of writers to write differently, to write new stories. I think that's really important. And I think the same thing has to happen with training methods, acting training methods, 
there have to be other ways to train our actors. And I will say connected to that. <laughs> so all our like, nice little answers are connected. It is like in order for new ways to be taught, we need new people with the power and the voices. And um, I think part of that reckoning will have to be for, again, like who's in your faculty? Who's currently teaching? Who's been teaching? Like, and, and to kind of, you know, like I'm done asking politely to make space for us um, because obviously it's not working. <laughs> so um, I, you know, like, the fear of, of folks stepping down to make space for other artists um, to, to be able to, te you know, like we, we gotta, we gotta, you know, like how to decenter yourself um, and your practice and think that just because you're stepping aside doesn't mean that you're being disappeared, just means that there's just a different light. There's a different like light that needs to come, you know, and different set of priorities, right? And so I think that's that's a that's a big that's a big thing I find, and that that's part ego, and that's part like what do you, you know, how how can you as a real ally like you know create space um, to make to and you know like this is the one of the only ways with your power to better our theater community, and that includes theater institutions, right? Um, and and so yeah, re-examining what those who's who's in those positions of power and repopulating that, I think is is going to be huge, um, because those different containers that we're all craving for, obviously, how you know how do we tell our stories? Like you know, because content is all there. It's just how you know the methods we know are are debilitating and they're often traumatizing and this one size fits all cookie cutter template like i like where did that come from right um and that's that's like historical and that that keeps getting passed on and we know now that it's not working right and we are we keep harming um the artistry and the potentials of our future students by doing this. And it's a vicious cycle that we somehow freaking can't get out of. And, and it's, it's, you know, um, and the pe people that, that do have the power can do something about it. If they, again, set aside the ego and actually, you know, do, do what they got to do to, to make sure that the voices and the people that do have, you know, to pass on that power to somebody that can actually like, you know, be that new voice and that new container of stories and to pass on that knowledge, I think is, is, um, I think it's going to be, that's, that's a huge part. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nina, Kevin, David, Mary Lo. Um, this perhaps is sort of uh, taking, I think, some of what we've just been discussing. It's a question from the audience and maybe just shifting it slightly, which is thinking about the, there's a the larger context looking at the pressure that the university and college and other t uh, training programs face from sort of a business. You know, you have to prove your works within these larger institutional contexts. But there's another part of this question that imagines the future of training that could be beyond universities. So I know, Nina, your work, um, you, your, your, your whole much of your much of your career, not just at factory, but before then as well at Cahoots and other places, has been involved in in training. Um, so I, I'm wondering what about or this question is sort of asking, what is the next training and mentoring environment if not in universities? I don't know. <laughs> like it's, I mean, it's 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 like we need it all. Like, and there's so like, there's space for all, right? Like, and, and, and I, I guess this is where, again, like, like, I think, you know, if we combine the forces of, you know, the spaces that we have now, we just need to freaking make it better. And then you have, you know, theater companies that have, you know, um, some theater companies that do have the mandates to kind of train and there's amazing theater companies like paprika for example that that are doing that and then you couple that like i i think that like you know mentorship mentorship in theater in particular like it's it's not you cannot just tell people and then they learn like you got to do it 
like like do you know what I mean and so we we need this we need as much space as we can to practice to fail to do good to push our potential and we're just and right now again like it's it's just different between you know BIPOC artists emerging especially student BIPOC artists and and the non BIPOC peeps like we we somehow are have different spaces to do that in and I, I, I I feel like, like, you know, if we actually kind of work together, like those, those can, as David mentioned before, like there needs to be a bridge between the institutions and then the, the practicing artists that, uh, that already are, that have mentors that have, you know, that have great teaching records somehow be combined. And we're not doing that. There is a great disconnect. Um, and a lot of it, again, is chalked up to schedules, availability, I'm too busy, I can't ever get her, you know, because I'm busy hustling myself, like, do you know what I mean? And, and we got to somehow, I don't know, realign. And again, again, that goes back to kind of a radical reshifting of the structure of how th theater training institutions are running their mentorships and their training. <laughs> Um, to coincide with theater artists and work, practicing working theater artists and theater organizations and their seasons, right? So there's we're actually talking to each other. And then we're creating spaces, um, conventional and unconventional. Agree. <laughs> We have another question from the audience. How do you honor your cultural and artistry when you are mixed and can more easily fall into the whiteness that theater school teaches you? How do I make space for my Latinx self in my work? You have to do it. Uh, yeah, you, you just do. <laughs> you can't deny that part of yourself. and. If you like say, you know, my daughters are half Latino, Latina, Latinas, and I make sure that they never forget that half that is Latina because the world favors the white part of them. And so I have to work extra hard for them to uh, connect to that part. Um, and I think you have to do your homework. You have to do the work. You have to really go out and uh, align yourself with companies that, that are you know, Latinx or other artists who are Latinx or read plays, read books, like um, as much as you can, you have to connect to it. You can't let the institution kill that part of you. Like I'm full Latina and they tried to kill that in me. It, it'll be easier for them to kill it in you because you have this dual kind of identity within you. So you can't let them kill that. You, you also, and but also don't let the institution tell you what you are. If one week you want to go in and be the, the white lead, then fucking do it. And the next week you want to be the Latinx lead, then fucking do that too. It's you, like, being, being mixed race is, um, is, is a very uh, difficult tightrope, tightrope walk. Um, it's a, it's a world full of code switching and, it um, uh, it is very easy to let other people tell you what you are, um, because you you are what is familiar to them, um, and you need to be assertive um, and um, and resolute in that you uh, own both subjectivities, and you have a you have a right to both, um, and you have a responsibility to both. That's all. I don't know why I just feel, I feel the need to cap everything I say, and that's all. Yeah. I don't, that's. And see, that's the next one. <laughs> Kevin, I want you to do that, okay? Um, <laughs> just like in your auditions, Kevin, just right after yes. scene. It's, yeah. usually, it's usually Nina saying that at the end of my audition. Yes. <laughs> but I'm not that kind of monologue at that point. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> oh, no, you are. You just yeah, don't I, know it. I just don't yeah. know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so, th so thank you for that. I don't know if anybody else wants to respond to, to that one in particular, um, just thinking about uh, yeah, your cultural positioning uh, and the challenges of theater school. There's an, another, lots, lots of conversations about school, another about um, making the work of BIPOC artists, whether that's monologues or plays, how might, how might they be made more accessible uh, to students? Uh, I think, again, that's probably, I, I would just venture very briefly that that's a responsibility that, again, that's on the professors and the people who are selecting the plays to teach in their classes. But I wonder if there, you have any, uh, from your experiences from the playwrights here, uh, publishing, are there other larger you know, changes that you've seen or that um, new opportunities for sharing work that you would, would like to encourage or anticipate? Can, can I just say, and I, I don't, once again, I, maybe I'm in a different seminar. Like I, I'm, I'm not answering any of the questions, but I just, I feel it's like, oh, this is such a stupid answer. So forgive me. Um, like I'm a sports fan, right? And if you got a bunch of players on your team coming in, you cater the way you play to the way, to the strengths of those players, right? That's, that just is just logic. So uh, you've auditioned and brought these kids into your class in theater school, it's incumbent, it's, it's, it's the responsibility of the institution to nurture and cater their program to the students that they brought in. So if you've got three uh, South Asian students, uh, a Black student, uh, a First Nation student, an Indigenous student, what have you, it's on you as the, as the instructor, as the teacher, as the, as the one who's supposed to be pouring knowledge in them to, to do your homework and find work that's going to feed them. If I'm growing, you know, roses in my garden, I'm gonna feed them the stuff that's gonna make roses grow. It's different than the stuff that makes, I don't know anything about flowers. <laughs> you started talking <laughs> about sports and then it became the horticulture. Like, Kevin! I, started talking about that, I realized I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead in the water. But, the, but you understand what I'm saying, right? Like, um, it, it's it's on them. And and I think that's, I keep I keep coming back to the same point is that it's this it's this lazy sort of, this is what you learn. This is like, this is your movement class. Let's find our purple chakras and turn the, the air. Like all that kind of stuff is great, but that's the stuff that made me get C's in, in theater school. Uh, and, and, you know, like it made my parents mad at me. And I'm like, but I don't, I don't speak that language, but I find you find your way through. It just, anyway, it just- Kevin, I would the argue work. that that's not a stupid answer at all. Well, thank you for that. The part about the part about horticulture is stupid, but I think the rest <laughs> of it is valid. Um, I think the um, I think like on on that the like that work has to be cumulative, right? Like it can't just be like if you have three South Asian artists coming in and, and, a, and a black student, and then the next year you don't have any. You don't just lose an Osho Load fight. up on a new tree rice. Yeah, that's like that's just like. You just have to you have to like roll that into like that practice that practice has to always be developing and always be renewing itself so that every every new class that you have you learn from them as much as they're meant to learn from you so you take in what the what those those people from those subjectivities taught you about the work that you need to know and then you teach it to the rest of them even if they even if there's nobody from that background in that class you still fucking teach it ding, ding, ding. because that's your job because that because you have just learned that that is what the theater includes that voice and so you keep teaching that voice whether was, or not you have anyone to speak to there was a situation at york where um an indigenous director wanted to direct an indigenous play and the classroom the school the students didn't want to do it because none of them were indigenous. And so they didn't feel uh, that they had the right to tell that story. So how do you deal with that situation? I totally agree with you, David. I totally agree that there has to be, a, you know, you can't just have the one black play and the one indigenous play just because you have those students in your class one year and then get rid of that work the next year. But what do you do when like the students are like, we don't feel comfortable playing indigenous characters. We are white. What do you do in that situation? Like they boycotted the play. It ended, like the, the thing shut down. They said, we will not do it. 
See, this is where I would be really curious as to what kind of conversation happened between the indigenous director and the indigenous playwright, which I really think is important, yeah. and what kind of conversation they had, what kind of space um, were they provided to, to have a dialogue with the students. Um, because again, this is where I go back to our initial question. It's vision and mission, right? And imagination, which again, often are <laughs> like all of them are like, so I, I think that, you know, the attempt to communicate like the whys, why are we doing this? Knowing, you know, cause I, I feel like both the playwright and the director are smart folks, would have been smart folks to kind of realize like, yep, yeah, it's, it's an all white, you know, or unless the school didn't tell them, um, but it's an all white cast and, you know, maybe it was, so, maybe it wasn't all white, but there weren't enough. In the yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, and I've been in that situation too, you know, teaching at, you know, other institutions and having to direct, but it was always clear what my mandate was coming in and why we were going to explore this particular piece, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Here are the parameters here's why you know it's important and then here's the invitation and I don't know like often there's a breakdown in communication when that happens and it's the wrong people telling the students why they're doing it like there's no and again and and I, my distrust for whoever is running the, the the show to like actually communicate that um, to the students. So there, there then lies, you know, black and white, right? Like, which I, I don't like living in binary, like, you know, that there's a gray area here, right? And that if you have an, a, an indigenous player, an indigenous director, like, you know, having a specific agenda and an open invitation into their process that these students can actually learn from, non-indigenous can learn from, then there's an agreement. Like, you know, then creative parameters are set then the white like then the the the, the class might have known like like do you know I mean the purpose of which this exercise is being done right yeah. but if there's nothing and they're only just seeing like the superficial of course it looks sketchy i wouldn't be, like do you know what I mean and so but often again the communication part you know often it's not it's not clear like nobody knows how to talk anymore about these things it's either they're too scared or they're ill-equipped. Um, and so it's seen as something that's superficial and something that's, yeah. So I, I, I would, that's how I would kind of see it or where, where it came down to. Yeah, I think we have to like, we have to stop being afraid of the, of the fact that we're, we, we don't deal with binaries. Yeah. We're like we're, we, we deal with a lot of gray area. Theater is messy um life is messy life is complicated <laughs> theater is complex um and that if you are if you're reacting to a binary then you're probably not really engaging with the full story yeah because you know the problem is is you know i don't i'm not at all neglecting the white students um they need to learn how to work with a bipoc director Right, like, because part of the problem I'm I've faced in my career is like I have these like, you know, white actors who have no regard for for somebody like me that walks into the room and I'm at the helm, and not like you know they need to, to be taught their manners too, right? Yeah. And some like have no idea how to how to do that. It's like you know all of a sudden I'm not a dude, a white dude, and they don't know how to behave around me, and so it's just as important that white actors see different kinds of of figures you know of authority of creative authority of you know that that you know they're okay being directed by a BIPOC person and that they know how to navigate that and they know how to you know like David and I come into these spaces uh and boy we've experienced <laughs> some of it all but like how to how to how to interact with a BIPOC playwright and some of these white kids don't know how to do that. They don't know how to talk about, like, I want to teach everyone to know how to, like, the tool, to give them the tools to unpack these things politically, holistically, like, as kind, generous human beings. And um, not going to happen if we're not there. And right? sometimes the reverse is, is the case. 
you know, sometimes white directors don't always know how to interact or, or work with BIPOC students. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for, for all of your words and, and hilarious moments and Devil Wears Prada references. Um, uh, in light of the fact that we have a, a couple minutes left, we just wanna take this remaining time to um, thank and introduce our curatorial um, team in our curtain call. So we, along with Marlies and I, we have uh, Marilo who has um, also been working with us on this team, as well as Zoe Marin, um, Jamie Robinson, Dante Jemmett, and we have Thomas Sayer, who has been on uh, tech support. Um, Zoe and I have been um, social mediaing this whole panel and getting the word out there, um, as well as researching along with Marlise, Jamie, Dante, and um, Marilo. Um, as well as co-moderating all of these panels. So thank you to everybody who came. Thank you to um, everyone, especially who attended. And again, thank you to Thomas for um, being the master behind the scenes. And I will leave it off to Marlies to finally wrap it up. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thank you, Cassandra. Thank you to, to Kevin and David and Mary Lo and Nina for serving up the truth your truth, the words that we, me as a white theater educator in the role of a department chair need to hear, I relish hearing, I'm grateful for your contributions today. So thank you for that. And I also wanna just thank again, our audience for being here. And if uh, the conversations will continue, we have one more panel tomorrow, which is thinking towards the future. Um, it's gonna be co-curated by Marilo and Zoe. That's happening at 6 p.m. tomorrow. So I hope to see many of you there as well. And I'm sure we'll continue to explore many of these themes. So thanks again to our panelists, curatorial team, Thomas and everybody else. Have a great night. And before we go, I think we should say it all one more time together. And scene. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>